There are a variety of special continuous time functions that we want to talk about. The unit step function, the unit ramp function, the unit pulse function, etc. So over the next couple of charts, let's just review what these are. This is a class that focuses on discrete time signals and systems, but these will be some continuous time functions that we'll still be using a fair amount in this course. So first, let's talk about the unit step function. The unit step function, we use the notation u of t, and u of t is equal to 0 for all time less than 0, and it's equal to 1 for all time greater than or equal to 0. If we plotted that, it would look like this. as a function of t, and it's 0 everywhere, except at the time origin it turns on to 1, and then it's equal to 1 for all time greater than or equal to 0. What about the unit ramp function? The unit ramp function, we use the notation r of t. r of t is equal to 0 for all time less than 0, and r of t is equal to t for time greater than 0. If we plotted this as a function of time, it looks like a line with a linear slope of 1 that is increasing starting at time 0, and it just increases with slope 1 for all time. That's why it's equal to t. What about the unit pulse function? The unit pulse function, we use the notation pi of t divided by capital T. And this is a function that's equal to 0 everywhere except within the time between minus capital T over 2 to capital T over 2. If we plotted this function as a function of time, this is what it looks like over the time interval between minus capital T over 2 to T over 2 it is equal to 1. For all other times, it is equal to 0. It's the denominator of the pulse function that tells us the total width. So in this case, the denominator was capital T. So that means that the unit pulse, as we've sketched it here, should have a total width of capital T. And this does. It goes from minus T over 2 to T over 2. Half plus a half is 1. So a total width of capital T. As another example, let's sketch the unit pulse function pi of omega over 4. So this is a slightly different function. It's not a function of time. It's a function of omega. But it has a very similar form. We're going to plot versus omega instead of t. It's the only difference. The denominator, 4, tells us the total width of this pulse function. So its total width is going to be 4 on the omega axis. So that means it's going to exist from minus 2 to 2. What about the function pi of 12t? How would, we, how would we sketch that? Well, this is a function of time again, so we're obviously going to be plotting against the time variable t. We would like to get it into the form where we have t divided by something so we can figure out what the width is. So if we do just a little bit of algebra, we can write 12t as t divided by 1 12th. So we've just kind of inverted it. And now we can tell what the total width of this signal is in the time domain. Its total width is a twelfth. So that means if we sketched it as a function of t, it would extend from minus one twenty-fourth to one twenty-fourth for a total width of one twelfth. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about the unit triangle function. The unit triangle function, we use the notation, this kind of ramp-looking thing, triangle t over capital T. The notation is similar in that the denominator, capital T, tells us the total width of the signal. When we write this function out in a piecewise function like this, it's a little uglier, but if we plot it, it's a very simple function to plot. The denominator, capital T, tells us the total width, so from minus T over 2 to T over 2 is a total width of T, and then it just basically looks like a triangle over this time interval. It has a peak of 1, that's why we call it the unit triangle function, and that peak occurs at time equal to 0. It's easy to check that the piecewise equation that we have defined above is correct. For example, if we let little t equal to 0, then the quantity 1 minus t over capital T over 2 is really just 1 minus 0 or 1. So it, it peaks up at the origin with value 1, just like we would think. Similarly, for little t equals t over 2, if we evaluate our function there, we would get 1 minus capital T over 2 divided by capital T over 2, which is 1 minus 1, which is 0. So when little t is equal to capital T over 2, the triangle function is equal to 0, and essentially it, it turns off then. 
So this piecewise equation that's find here, although it's a little messy, it is easy to verify that it is correct. Let's talk about the sinc function now. The sinc function, the way that we use it in this class, we define it as sinc of t equals sine t over t. If we plotted this, we're, we're used to seeing what this looks like, it looks like a sinus. So the numerator of the sinc function is sine of t, and that's what gives the plot of the sinc function this oscillating nature. The denominator of the sinc function is t. So as t gets very, very large, the denominator gets very, very large and makes the sinc function decay, get smaller. So the ratio turns into this sinusoid that is decaying as a function of time. One thing to be aware of and to be careful with is the alternative definition of the sinc function. So some other People in other textbooks use a slightly different definition of the sinc function. They define sinc of t as sine pi t over pi t. So notice the slight difference. In this definition, whatever the argument is, in this case the argument of the sinc function is t, when you actually write out the equation, you throw a pi in the numerator and you throw an extra pi in the denominator. If you plot this, it looks exactly the same. It still looks like a sinusoid oscillating that decays due to the denominator, so it looks the same. The difference is where this function goes through zero. So let's think about this for a minute. When t is equal to 1, sine of pi t would be sine of pi, and sine of pi would be 0. So with this alternative definition of the sinc function, when t is equal to 1, or 2, or 3, or 4, or minus 1, or minus 2, for all those values of t, sine of pi t is 0. So this has the nice property that the sinc function goes through zero crossings for integer values of the argument. So this is the motivation for this alternative definition. The sinc function goes through zeros at integer values of the argument. Both of these definitions of sinc are commonly used. You just need to be aware of them, especially when you're doing kind of table lookup work with Fourier transforms. If you have an extra pi floating around or if you have a, there's a pi in the table that you don't have, uh, just need to be aware that there are slightly different definitions of the sinc function, and if you have an extra constant floating around, it might be due to the fact that you're using a definition that is different than the sinc definition of the table that you're using. Okay, let's talk about the unit impulse function. For notation, we use delta of t equals zero, and it's equal to zero for all time not equal to zero. So this function is zero almost everywhere, but it also has the property that if you integrate it from minus infinity to infinity, so if you integrate this function over the entire time axis, you get one. When we plot this function, we plot it as a function of t, and it's very simple to plot because it's equal to zero literally everywhere, but at the origin we draw this arrow and we mark the height of it with 1, but that's not really a height, that's really the density of this function. And it's really a density because we get 1 when we actually integrate this function. So it's almost as if this function has an area of 1, but to represent it we actually just write this area arrow and write a height of 1. But in reality that arrow indicates an infinite height with a zero width. So it's kind of a, a different function. What if I wanted to sketch delta of t minus tau? So let's draw that. And let's assume now that tau is greater than zero. Well, I'm going to plot as a function of time, an impulse function. This impulse function turns on at the time t equals tau. So when I plot my delta function, I have a delta function at time tau, and its density or height is of height 1. And the reason we went ahead and sketched this signal, delta of t minus tau, is because that lets us talk about the sifting property. The sifting property of the impulse response, if you remember, it says that if I have a function f of t, and I multiply it by some time-shifted impulse response, and I integrate that quantity over the entire time axis, what I get out is the value of the function at time tau. So in this integral here, we're actually multiplying by an impulse located at time t equals tau, and when I integrate that time-shifted impulse multiplied by my function, what I actually get out is the function at the location of the impulse. So the impulse has sifted out one value of my underlying function. 
There are some very simple relationships between all these functions that we can quickly recall. If we integrate the unit step function, we get the ramp function. Also, if we differentiate the unit step function, we get the impulse function. So these come in handy sometimes when doing the mathematics and some of the problems that we'll be working.